Today, we're going to try to make this nuclear reactor melt down. Pulsing reactor in five, four, three, two, one, five. In 1956, a group of nuclear scientists gathered to attempt to achieve the impossible. Their goal? to invent a nuclear reactor so safe that it could be given to a group of high school children to play with without any fear that they would get hurt. They called their invention Triga. And surprisingly, there are dozens of these reactors around the US today, and many of them are located right downtown on university campuses. But if this fuel is so incredibly safe, then why haven't all the reactors around the world started using it? And how does its inherent safety actually work? This is the story of one of the most underrated inventions of the past 100 years, and what it could mean for humanity if we bring it back. And to kick things off, we're going to go to a real live nuclear reactor and put this fuel to the test. Let's go. We're on UT Austin's campus and this building might not look like much, but within these walls is a nuclear reactor. And today we're meeting Bill, the director of UT Austin's Nuclear Engineering Teaching Laboratory and the scientist managing this reactor. He's going to be our guide as we see this fuel in action and put it to the ultimate test. We're actually going to try to make this fuel melt down. So Bill's here, let's go check it out. Clean. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to do a reactor pulse. What we're going to do is set the reactor up into a subcritical configuration. So what that means is the reactor is shut down. The transient rod, which is one of our control rods that we can actually pneumatically fire out of the core, will actually be placed fully inserted in the uh, reactor. Uh, we'll then apply uh, pressurized air to the rod, which will then actually cause that rod to lift up and eject from the core. As it's traveling out of the reactor, the reactor is then going to go critical at some point as when it's at some particular height, and then the reactor will go super critical. And once it's super critical, the power in the reactor is going to start going up really fast. Uh, it's then going to start producing heat in the fuel. As that heat's being produced, that's going to cause the uranium zirconium hydride uh, reactivity feedback effect to cause power to go back down. If you think about it, this is crazy. Rule number one in nuclear reactor operation is to not rapidly remove the control rods. The control rods are the things that normally slow down the nuclear chain reaction. And in any other reactor, rapidly removing these rods could cause it to melt down. And Bill is telling us that we are about to rapidly remove the rods, not by hand, but by using compressed air to eject the rods at an even faster rate. Why would Bill let us do this? This is the magic of trigger fuel. But before before we eject the rods, let's dive a little deeper and explore how this safety mechanism actually works. Uh, so this is our fuel elements. The fuel itself actually sits in that space right there. The zirconium hydride is instantaneous, unstoppable effect. It's a, it due just to the physics of the fuel. Mm. And so it's what makes this reactor what we call student proof. That's why we use it as a training reactor. You can come in here, you can run the reactor all you want. There's no way you're going to break it. The fuel will survive any event that we can do out here. So what exactly is Triga fuel? Its chemical formula is uranium zirconium hydride. The uranium part is what releases the energy in the form of heat when it undergoes fission. The zirconium is there for structural integrity, but the hydride part actually means that there are hydrogen atoms, i.e. protons, distributed all throughout the fuel. So what's the point of the hydrogen? Here's Bill again to explain. There's hydrogen then integrated into the fuel material. So when fission reactions occur, uranium fissions creates fission fragments. Those fission fragments deposit uh, heat inside the fuel. So the hydrogen atoms then start to, to move to vibrate uh, and as they start to vibrate then whenever the neutrons come in and scatter off of that hydrogen instead of losing energy the neutrons will then gain energy and when that occurs then it's going to try to drive power back down. For nuclear fission to continually produce energy you need what's called a chain reaction. 
This is what happens when one uranium atom splits, releasing energy, but also releasing two to three neutrons. If each of those neutrons goes on to cause another atom to split, very quickly you can get a lot of energy released. But the thing is, when these neutrons are released in each splitting, they are by default going too fast to cause another split. What you need is something to slow down these neutrons, so they will be more likely to go on to split other uranium atoms. This is called the moderator. In traditional nuclear reactors, the moderator is also the coolant. It's the water flowing around the core to keep it cool and take the heat away to the turbine for power production. The hydrogen atoms in the water are what slow the neutrons enough to allow them to go on and split more uranium atoms. Uranium zirconium hydride fuel is unique in the sense that the moderator is inside the fuel rather than the coolant. As Bill said, when the hydrogen, aka hydride, in the fuel gets hot, it becomes a worse moderator, meaning the neutrons remain fast and are less likely to cause fissions. And as a result, the chain reaction slows. And while other hypersafe fuels like triso are able to achieve inherent safety safety in different ways, only Triga fuel can maintain such a high energy density, 10 times higher than Triso, which makes the best potential for achieving strong economics. So with all that being said, we are now ready to go actually try to make this nuclear reactor melt down. Let's go. Seeing the pulse was incredible. By the way, you might be wondering what that blue glow was. That's called Cherenkov radiation. It's basically what happens when you have electrons going faster than the speed of light in water, kind of like an optical sonic boom. In any case, the fact that those engineers decades ago could create a nuclear fuel that actually cannot melt itself down is mind-blowing. So who were they and how did they do it? It all started in 1956 when a 30-year-old physicist by the name of Frederick de Hoffman had a creative idea. He assembled a group of 40 other scientists, all of whom were tired of applying their efforts towards using nuclear technology for weapons as the government and military had wanted. The group banded together in a small red schoolhouse for one entire summer and brainstormed ways that nuclear technology could be commercialized for the betterment of humankind. They knew that a critical feature of a commercial nuclear energy technology would be an incredibly high level of safety. And so they set out to invent a reactor which in their words would be so safe that it could be given to a group of high school children to play with without any fear that they would get hurt. Three years later they had already finished the design, built and licensed a prototype, and they hosted a grand unveiling to demonstrate the incredible inherent safety of their trigger reactor. The reactor was a hit, selling 60 copies before the program was shut down. But you might be wondering, if this fuel is so incredible, then why was it never used commercially for power production? It turns out there are three main reasons. First, most of the reactors around the world today are water-cooled. While water coolant works for a trigger reactor meant for university students, it doesn't work well for power production because the water can't take the heat away fast enough. The fuel is too finicky, it's too safe when paired with water as a coolant. Second, the fuel must be kept below a certain temperature. Too hot and the hydrogen will leave the fuel, called dissociation, rendering it less useful. Note that when this happens, the fuel simply doesn't work as well. It's not a safety concern. But yeah, there is the issue that uh, if you go up to higher temperatures, you potentially could uh, dissociate the hydrogen out. And if that hydrogen leaves, then there's nothing there any longer to cause the reaction to happen? Yeah, if you lost the hydrogen completely. So what would happen in our fuel here is first, if the hydrogen actually disassociated, it would come out as hydrogen gas and it would be stuck in the space between the fuel slug and the cladding material. So it could still provide some degree of moderation, but it would no longer provide that temperature feedback effect because it's no longer integrated into the fuel. And third, scientists at the time thought it wouldn't make sense to use this fuel for power production because it was more expensive to make than basic fuel. This was at a time when reactor design was like the Wild West. 
and regulatory and safety requirements were less stringent. What has occurred over the many years is that as we've discovered new potential issues with reactors, we add additional safety systems. The, one of the issues with doing that is you have made the systems more complicated. So you've added complications by adding on an engineered system. The future of reactors is actually not really to do that. The future reactor is to go back to the original design. And so by using things like uranium zirconium hydride, you can allow the fuel to have the physics to survive these events as opposed to having a, a movable engineered system. The other difficulties you would have in creating a gigawatt class reactor from the, the inherent physics of zirconium hydride fuels it will work, but it will require uh, certain changes to the core structure, to the fuel structure. So I don't think anybody was willing to go to the effort to make all the design changes, testing the fuel, building a whole new fuel factory to do this, uh, applying for licenses to, to basically re-engineer what we know today as a besting us PWR. And if you could find a way to resolve the water coolant and hydrogen dissociation challenges, you could be left with a pretty incredible reactor design. That's exactly what we're aiming to do at Allo Atomics. We fundamentally believe that if nuclear will ever be ubiquitous, it should be as inherently safe as one of those university research reactors on downtown campuses. Our co-founder and CTO, Yasser Arafat, started the Marvel program at INL one of the major nuclear labs around the US today. The program started in 2020, and in 30 months, the team was able to finish the design of the first new advanced reactor in decades. This reactor uses uranium zirconium hydride as the fuel, along with liquid metal as the coolant. To dive deeper on this, here's Yasser to talk about how we're engineering the all one reactor to pull off power production with uranium zirconium hydride fuel. We had to do a lot of changes from the Marvel design to all one that allows us to make a high powered, high temperature reactor with this fuel tank. And there's a ton of challenges that we'll have to solve through and that's where a lot of the innovations come in. So the step number one is making the fuel pin diameter smaller. Because if you want to generate a lot of heat, you have to introduce a lot of cooling at the same time. And when you use sodium, the ability to cool that fuel pin becomes significantly better. So the combination of adding a coolant that has very good thermal properties, along with making the fuel pin skinnier, now you are able to generate a lot of heat and be able to remove that heat without exceeding that high center line temperature. Also in Marvel, the heat was being driven by natural convection, whereas in Allo One, we have three pumps that pushes the coolant through the core at very, very high flow rate, high velocities. You get a lot of flow around the core to make sure we can extract that much power out as well. And that's why Marvel is 100 kilowatt thermal and we are 30,000 kilowatt thermal in the all one design. Fundamentally, we're not reinventing the science. What we're really trying to solve here is use that proven technology and trying to come up with a configuration that makes economic sense. Despite our optimism that this will work out, not everyone thinks the hydrogen dissociation issue is something we can actually solve. The other thing that is probably the biggest concern is the fact that you have this hydrogen disassociation. So as you get to higher and higher temperatures, the hydrogen comes out of the fuel, right? Or comes out of the solid matrix and pressurizes the element. And so we sort of have a balance between the safety and your ability of the fuel to handle higher temperatures. The main challenge with this fuel type is the fact that the uranium zirconium hydride has hydrogen fused into the pellets. And if you exceed that temperature where it's too hot, like around 650 to 750 degrees Celsius, then the hydrogen tends to move out from the hot zone to the cold zone. When the hydrogen leaks out of the fuel and it's doing this trickle over a few years, you're gonna eventually lose enough to where you're not gonna be able to maintain the chain reaction anymore. The key is to design the temperature profiles and barrier materials in the core just right so that we lose the hydrogen at an acceptable rate. In our case, we've lowered the hydrogen amount that we've dissolved into the fuel. This means it exerts less pressure into the gas gap and consequently substantially reduces the hydrogen leakage rate through the edge of the fuel. Uh, you also have a cost 
of their zirconium hydride and supply chain issue. This fuel type is not easy to come by. There's a legacy of pressurized water reactors being used in commercial power, maybe not because they're the best reactor design ever, but because that they're well-established, well-run. They want to deal with known things that they can control the risk, et cetera. Regardless of the challenges, we are on a mission to prove it one way or the other. Will this fuel work for a reactor that's operating at a higher temperature for five, five or six years? In some situations, it's a matter of we just need to be bold. We need to take a risk. Um, we need to have the courage to fail. Because in the nuclear industry, in the 1950s and 60s, um, even in the 70s, you saw that there were government, there were researchers, there were universities, there were industry and businesses that said, I'm willing to invest and I'm willing to take the risk that there might be failures, but I'm gonna learn from that failure and what I learn is gonna propel me forward. Um, right now, the nuclear industry has been built the past 30, 40 years on an entire career that is afraid to fail. We need to learn how we fail safely so that we can continue to propel forward. The challenge for Arlo is gonna be, what do I have to do to get regulatory approval of this fuel? I think it can be done. I'm excited about it. One thing we do know is to how to make zirconium hydride fuel. How you have to modify the fuel design and how you have to make sure it works under Arlo's operating conditions will be the key. I think as a country, and as a world, we need to advance the technology, we need to build, we need to test. Where we are right now, I find very exciting within the nuclear industry because I think we're getting to a point where we are building and testing. And that's what we need to do to move things forward. You only have one way of knowing, and that's build it, turn it on, and find out. This fuel has been around for over six decades, and now we've given it a second look. We know that there are clear challenges to overcome to make this fuel work, but we also know how incredible the future could be if this is all possible. Nuclear energy should be powering the majority of the world's clean energy needs, and we believe that this is the best way to get us there.